the limbic dysfunction, what are the strategies there? You mentioned Annie Hopper has a program. Is it, are there exercises? Is it a weekend? Is it months long? Is it an hour a day? What does it look like? Okay. Um, you can get it in two main forms. You could go to an Annie Hopper workshop, which are excellent, and I would highly recommend it. However, they tend to be held in hotels, and many of my very sensitive patients can't go to a hotel. The, um, the sense and the chemicals would um, throw them under the bus. They couldn't possibly do that. So she does have available um, DVDs in which she teaches um, exactly how to do these I would call them a combination of exercises and visualizations. She based her work on Norman Doidge's research into um, um, brain or neuroplasticity. They're very well thought out um, and, from my experience, very effective. She urges people, perhaps a little too strongly, to do them an hour a day. Um, some of my patients are intimidated by that or that their cognitive ability wouldn't allow them to do an hour a day. So I, I urge my patients who are doing her program is do what you can and modify it for what you can. And if that's 15 minutes a day, great. Um, if you can do it an hour a day, that is quite effective and I do recommend that. I realized that I glossed over porphyria. We didn't go into that one. Okay. I don't know that you glossed at all. But, um... Um, I, I missed it. It's probably more, more appropriate. Um, would you plug that into our, our model here and tell me how that relates to people with yeah. complex chronic disease? Sure. And I, I hope at this point that listeners are not throwing up their hands of, my God, this is too complicated. Um, I, I would urge you, if you or a loved one or a family member is suffering with any of these things, just start somewhere. And I'm hoping that my book um, will be a roadmap that would help you understand where to start and how to approach it. But this isn't something to give up on because every single thing that we're talking about is treatable. Every single thing we're talking about is curable. So um, this is not intended to be a book to overwhelm you, but a book that will um, inspire you to go, ah, I haven't looked at that yet. Ah, there's a dozen more things I haven't even tried yet. So I really, uh, gosh, there's a whole lot more I can do that I haven't even looked at. So please, that's the perspective with which the book was written, and I hope you take it. Um, Porphyria. Um, oh, as if this wasn't complicated enough. Um, first of all, Let's talk about what porphyrins are. Um, when the body recycles hemoglobin, as it does every day, um, um, you all probably know that your body makes red blood cells, and the red blood cells are only designed to live for 90 to 120 days, at which point we recycle them. The major component of red cells that we recycle is hemoglobin. When the body breaks down hemoglobin, if it doesn't have the right enzymes, you will get a buildup of the breakdown products, which are called porphyrins. And so porphyria is simply an accumulation of the breakdown products of heme that should not be occurring, but are. And unfortunately, these chronic illnesses predispose the body to difficulty with processing heme. So it is not a shock or a surprise that some of our patients are a bit more predisposed to having porphyria because their ability to break hemoglobin down is compromised. When the porphyrins build up, they cause symptoms. Shock, very similar to everything we've been talking about, similar to the, math, to the mast cell activation symptoms, similar to mold, similar to Lyme. But there are a couple of symptoms that are more 
of a telling symptom that would push you in that direction. So if a patient develops a relatively sudden onset of intense nausea and vomiting, intense anxiety, intense abdominal pain and discomfort, after starting a new medication of any kind or a new supplement, there's a good chance that they may be having a porphyria. The other tip-off is a porphyria looks like a Herx, except Herxes go away after two or three days, porphyrias do not. So if you have what looks like a Herx, but it's going a week, a week and a half, two weeks, think porphyria, not Herx, because it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. So that, that's the startup. And is there testing? Yes. Um, the testing is, and again, porphyrins are like the mast cell activator mediators. They're fleetingly, transiently into the body. So you want to do a test by simply collecting a urine, spot urine, just one urine specimen. Collect it when you feel the worst, most anxious, most throwing up, just awful. Wrap that specimen in aluminum foil because their porphyrins are sensitive to light and put them in the refrigerator. And if you can, get them to a laboratory when you can and have them tested for porphyrins. There are eight different porphyrins that they routinely test for. And if they, any of them are elevated, we have a tip off that you may have a porphyria going on here. And then what kind of treatment would be specific to this? If you can get it, absolute best treatment is intravenous uh, 10% um, dextrose, which is an IV. Um, not a lot of places do that. It's usually 5% dextrose. Even 5% will help, but 10% dextrose specifically um, shuts down the way the, the liver processes porphyrins and stops the liver from making it. Okay, so this so, is one of the exceptions where we, we think sugar is good. <laughs> This is a huge exception because dietarily, um, the treatment is high carb diet. So here's where we really run into difficulties where um, I've been telling you for a long time in this interview that we're talking high protein, low carb. And now I'm going to do a 180 on you, which goes, if porphyria is, a, is rearing its ugly head, you want a high, a high carb diet. You even want to try, if you cannot get 10% dextrose, you can go to the pharmacy and get what are called glucose pills, dextrose pills, same thing, and then take one or two every hour to see if that will help turn this around. So a very, very different treatment. So it, it, very, really important to identify if this is part of what's going on because the treatment is just drastically in the opposite direction. Uh, precisely. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't think there's many people, you're the only person that I've heard talking about this on my conference circuit. So, um, it feels like it's probably getting missed a lot of the time that it's happening. Um, uh, I, I can assure you that it is, um, last year after I read, um, Stephen Rochlitz's book on porphyrins, which I encourage people to read, um, I started testing a number of my patients who met these criteria. I didn't mention. I didn't test them all, but I, I ran about 20 tests thus far, 15 of whom turned out positive for porphyrins when they met these criteria. So it may be a lot more prevalent than people realize. Yeah, and very significant. Thank you for listening to Collective Insights. For the full show notes on this episode and for more great interviews, visit us at neurohacker.com slash collective insights. If you liked this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and leave us a five-star review on iTunes.